Welcome to MedShark Insider with Bill Fukui, your expert host on all things medical marketing and SEO. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of MedShark Insider. Uh, today, I'm, we're going to be talking about a topic that I think is um, somewhat not really talked about, but I think everybody needs to deal with. And, uh, you know, in the back of their mind, they're thinking about it, but nobody really talks about it, you know, uh, and that's price and price transparency. And today's guest is really one of the leaders in the medical uh, arena that has really kind of cut the water for a lot of practices to really just, you know, call the elephant in the room and let's, uh, let's, let's address the things that consumers have the best, you know, the most interest in, and that that's cost. And how, how do we help our staff and help our practices become better equipped to deal, not only just deal with, but how to leverage pricing and stuff like that. I think that's what we'd like to accomplish in our conversation today. So I've got Jonathan Kaplan, who is actually a, a, a practicing surgeon, uh, and he's also the owner of Build My Bod, which is a software, a platform that he introduced me to. I don't know, was it a couple of years ago, uh, Jonathan? That you at least you a few now. At? We're getting older. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I guess I'm getting older. <laughs> well, welcome, Jonathan. Can you do me a favor and just give the the audience a little bit of background for those that don't know you? I, I think a lot of people do, especially in the cosmetic and plastic surgery arena. But give a little background for our audience. Sure. Uh, again, I'm Jonathan Kaplan. Thanks for the introduction. And it's funny, you mentioned about price transparency, how it's always in the back of everybody's mind. One of the first episodes of the uh, MedShark Insider that I saw you on was you were talking to the uh, founder of Optical. And even though mm -hmm. Optical does a lot of other things, y'all spent a lot of time talking about pricing and people calling out asking about cost and things like that. And y'all had y'all talked about different solutions. And I'll bring up our, our solution with Build My Bod Health. But uh, my background, I'm a board certified plastic surgeon. I'm the youngest of seven kids originally from Alexandria, Louisiana. Uh, my wife and I, we met in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana after I finished my plastic surgery training at Cleveland Clinic. I moved back to Louisiana in 2007 after Hurricane Katrina had hit New oh. Orleans and yeah. kind of shifted a lot of the population to Baton Rouge. And so a job opportunity came available in Baton Rouge in 2007, only because of the biggest US natural disaster ever to hit. Yeah. Um, and so an opportunity came up. I went to work at Our Lady of the Lake Hospital as an employed plastic surgeon. And they treated me really well. I was the first uh, plastic surgeon they ever hired. So I was able to run the practice as though it was my own, even though it was uh -huh. honestly on their dime. And, um, <laughs> And after about six years, uh, as I started to get into more cosmetic uh, pr uh, procedures, I really wanted to have my own operating room. That was really the driving force of why I ultimately left. I mean, I had access to the surgery center, but, you know, surgery center patients or cosmetic patients in a surgery center, you're next to people getting colonoscopies, you're next to kids getting tubes in their ears and screaming right. and crying. Uh, so it's not the best environment for a cosmetic patient. So I really wanted my own operating room. And uh, so we looked around and we actually found a job listings, a job listing on the American Society of Plastic Surgeons website about a practice in San Francisco. The doctor was retiring and he had his own accredited operating room in his practice uh, and he wanted to have uh, somebody come and take it over. So we moved to San, well, first we came to check it out in 2013 in February of 2013. And we got here, we checked it out. It was legitimate. It was a real operating room. It was accredited. Right. It was in Pacific Heights, uh, looking out onto the South Tower of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and it was, Beautiful. it was pretty, yeah, it was pretty incredible. We couldn't really believe it. Um, and we was like, you know, this seems too good to be true. The part that we didn't understand is that everything was like six times as expensive <laughs> compared to compared yeah. Louisiana. And when I say six times, we did the math. It's truly six times. Is it really? Oh my I mean, God. Our, the amount we were paying for mortgage went up by six. Oh my multiplied God. by six. Yeah. Wow. Saying um, that either means we got a really nice place here, or we had a really terrible place back in Baton Rouge, so you can figure that out. But um, <laughs> or maybe a combination of both, maybe <laughs> a little bit of both. <laughs> uh, so we um, so we came and checked it out. It was legit. I had my attorneys check it out, uh, accountant check it out. They said, yeah, this is legitimate. His his tax records look appropriate and everything. So we moved out here in uh, the end of May, beginning of June, 2013. Took over the practice. He stuck around for about four and a half months and then retired, which was the plan. Mm -hmm. And so it's been mine for the last almost eight years now. It's pretty incredible. Great. Great. Um, and we love it here. We're here for good. Um, 
I'll be actually on another webinar uh, webcast uh, talking about the experience of buying a practice. So I don't want to get too much into that here, but the uh, kind of just the financial aspects of it or how he valued it. Um, and, uh, but we took it over, bought it with an SBA loan, which back then an SBA loan, like people think SBA loans are great now because that's how you get the PPP loan. Uh -huh. And they think it's just, oh, you get your money in two weeks. Right. Regularly, the SBA doesn't send you your money for about five months. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was like ridiculous. And I went through, you don't go through the SBA. I mean, ultimately the money comes from the SBA or it's guaranteed by the SBA, but the money, right. you get it from a bank. And I mm -hmm. went through Chase Bank. And so you would think there'd be some institutional knowledge there, but it, it was awful. They, it was like the person I was dealing with, it was the first time they had ever done an SBA loan. It was, yeah. it was, it was really kind of a painful process, but I've rethought my opinion of the SBA because the PPP was so efficient and they, they did a great job with that. Um, anyway, so we took over the practice and now I'm here for the, almost the last eight years. Well, uh, that's, so that's super. a quick background on me. Yeah, and that's great, you know, and, and with that kind of background as a practitioner, not as a business consultant, even though you now you're, you're talking about business related operational getting loans and stuff like that. Um, and we kind of talked early in, in our conversation today, I said, you have an entrepreneurial spirit that I respect, I have a tremendous respect for you, and, and the way that you think. Um, what made you start thinking about, you know, price transparency and stuff as that related to your practice? Because I know it's stuff that practices deal with every day, but you were one that kind of, I guess, embraced it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we were, you know, we we're in the trenches just like any other doctor. And while I was at Our Lady of the Lake Hospital in Baton Rouge, um, during those first few years, I was in practice there. Again, I was there for six years from 20, 2007 to 2013 and then moved here. But uh, in those first couple of years in Baton Rouge, uh, we had patients just like any other practice, not even just cosmetic, any practice, people yeah. asking how much something cost. And so we had people call and ask us how much it cost. And I mm -hmm. knew that there was like, as at that moment, there was two ways of handling it. There was the one option of just going through all the pricing, explaining it all to the patient. And that would take a while. And then the patient would say, thanks and hang up. And that was it. Right. And you're like, that was annoying. Uh -huh. The other option was to say, oh, well, you've got to come in for a consultation so we can really know what you, what's appropriate for you. And then that would just aggravate the patient because they're like, they don't want to come in for a consultation for 45 minutes. And quite frankly, I don't know why the doctor wants to do that because a lot of times the consultation is free. So you're going to spend 45 minutes of time forcing the patient to bear their deepest insecurities only to find out that they can't afford it at the end because they have sticker right. shock. So I was like, okay, those two options are just like terrible. We have to come up with another, I, another a better way. And I was like, maybe there's something online where a patient can check pricing. And the only thing I really found was, you know, there were different trade organizations like ASAPs and ASPS that had pricing, but it was only the surgeon's fee. It yeah. wasn't the ancillary fees like OR, anesthesia, implants. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, that's like not really helpful because I mean, that's like 50% of the cost that you're not telling them about. Right. And even more aggravating, the patient sees the price on those websites. They come in and like, I thought a breast dog was $3,000. <laughs> exactly. I, like, well, I thought it, it was half be, this cost. It, cost right. it might be 3000 in Florida, but but here <laughs> you have to get anesthesia. Um, <laughs> uh, and the implants. Uh, but it, so, uh, so we... Um, so that I, I just realized that that wasn't adequate. And I was thinking about, it, I was like, you know, but the thing that's frustrating is that when the patient does come in, it's not like we're making up the numbers, the, the uh, patient care coordinator or the office manager, they have a fee schedule. I mean, right. you've got the numbers. So why not digitize it and make it available to the consumer? But then also thinking about it from, you know, from the consumer's perspective, that's great. You give them the pricing information, but from the doctor's perspective, I realized you got to have something in it for the doctor. You have to have, you want some buy-in from the doctor. So how do you make that beneficial for the doctor? Well, require the consumer to put in their contact information first to get the pricing, but you got to give them the pricing. Don't ask for the contact information and say, oh, our office staff will follow up with you to provide. Right. That is not, that's not what I'm talking about. That, they they, they all, they're going to feel manipulated when you do absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I knew that if we, if you give us the pricing information, I promise you, as long as you gave us a real email address, you will get a true estimate based on our fee schedule in your inbox. And that was how Build My Bod Health was born. Um, that we allow the, it started out as an iPhone app, still is an iPhone app, but we've added additional platform or, or avenues for people to check pricing either through a price estimator on embedded into their mm -hmm. website, also a chat bot now embedded into their website. The consumer can check pricing, and so. Now the consumer can check pricing, 
but only after they provide our contact information and then they get an email directly delivered to them instantly, automatically sent to their inbox with a breakdown of pricing that uh, basically it's all the pricing that the doctor has uploaded to our database right. so that we can immediately send that pricing out to the consumer. Um, and then they get that instant gratification and then the doctor in return gets the same email with all the patient's uh, contact information that they've provided. Um, one of the interesting things about it is that I thought of this while I was employed by Our Lady of the Lake, uh, this mm -hmm. hospital, and I knew that it was, it belonged to them. The idea belonged to them. And right. so this is like 2009 when I had the idea. And so I, I, I'll never forget this meeting I had with the marketing department of Our Lady of the Lake saying, hey, I've got this price transparency idea of how we can generate leads. And if you think about how, and we're going to talk about this more later, but if you think about how the federal government has just now in 2021 forced hospitals to provide pricing on their website, you can imagine in 2009 how they were absolutely completely uninterested in the idea of price transparency. Zero. Zero, Zero and, interest. <laughs> exactly. And I'm not talking badly about uh, Our Lady of the Lake as far as just- No, it, that's how all, that all was the industry. Were. It was the industry, but I was trying to explain to them, you know, I'm not trying to get you to show pricing for your x-rays or for your gallbladder surgery. I'm just talking about, I'm a plastic surgeon providing cash pay cosmetic procedures. How about just in my own little world, allow this to happen? And and I was asking if they wanted to pay to move forward and build this out. And they weren't interested. And I was like, well, you not being interested isn't good enough. I need it on paper. I need you yeah. to release the rights to me. And in my subsequent contract, they added an addendum where they gave me uh, complete intellectual property rights to the idea. And so I still have that piece of paper good. Um, signed by the CEO. Um, and I appreciate them for releasing that to me. And so we've taken it on uh, and built it out from there. So what you, when you're talking about price transparency and doing that online digitally, um, you know, on the website, et cetera, um, how does that, how have you found that that has helped both in terms of lead gen as well as, you know, case acceptance, uh, your consultation schedule? I, I mean, because pricing is something that the consumer has to, that it's in the back of their mind through it, the entire buying process. It's not just because they picked up the phone and called that it's still not a question when they come into the office, when they're, you know, what, when they're signing up, they're, they're in the consult room with the PCC signing papers. Absolutely. It's on their mind the entire process. Right. So how has doing more of the price transparency, upfront pricing and stuff like that, making that more accessible to consumers has that changed, you know, what a practice experiences in terms of uh, patient experience as well as revenue? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically the centerpiece of my entire marketing uh, model. Everything that I do is based on initially providing pricing information to the patient. And I know that everybody's down on pricing. And it's just really strange because how is healthcare the only industry where you don't like, it, it's funny because you don't expect to know the pricing ahead of time in, in healthcare. It's not only that the healthcare industry doesn't want to provide you pricing ahead of time, but the consumer kind of is like throwing up their hands. Like, well, of course I don't get the pricing. Like they've accepted that as a reasonable thing. Like, you know, we all want to know how much the car costs before you go to the dealership sure. or how much the house is before you go to the open house. So somehow healthcare has gotten a pass on this and we can talk about the historical aspects and I understand why it evolved that way, uh, but people don't necessarily think of that. And they just like kind of assume that, yeah, of course I don't get pricing. And so the thing I have to explain to doctors is that, that you need to embrace it because it is good for the consumer. And then the way we're doing it, it's good for the practice, right. uh, but also realize that doctors were so down on this, the healthcare industry in general was so down on this that I knew I had to have good data to prove it to them. I was like, you okay. have to understand. The other thing I have to kind of also, the caveat I always have to throw out there is that this is not a race to the bottom. People will say, oh, well, if you show pricing, that means you're, it's, you're gonna have to be the cheapest now. It's like, yeah. no, that's not what it means. You can be the most no. expensive. In fact, patients will probably think you're better because you're the most expensive. So that's always been a strange thing to me is that because you talk about pricing, that automatically means that you have to get competitive and you have to lower your price. And now maybe that might be true for a lab test or an x-ray, which is a commodity and it doesn't matter where you go to get right. that lab test. It's the same CBC. And so, yes, that may drive down price, but that makes sense to me. It's like, okay, 
you're not providing any kind of special service, you shouldn't be able to be as expensive as you want to be. But if you're doing a facelift or a breast dog, um, or, or you're, you have better results with your bariatric mm -hmm. surgery, you're quicker and do a better job and have fewer complications mm -hmm. with your gallbladder removal, then you should be able to negotiate a higher right. price with the insurance company, although that's not always uh, feasible. But anyway, the, the point is, it doesn't have to be a race to the bottom. It doesn't have to be cheaper. But to convey this to doctors and get them to sign on, since they were so against price transparency, we knew we had to provide some data. So that was what was so great about coming to a new place like San Francisco. It was fresh and I was able to implement it into this practice. And so I was able to generate data over the course of the first year and I got it published in a uh, scholarly plastic surgery journal, um, Annals of Plastic Surgery. Uh, we can include it in the show notes. People can link to it, mm -hmm. it's open source and you don't have to have a, a subscription to the journal. But we are able to find just some top level numbers uh, based over the course of a year, all the leads that came in uh, that we generated through the price estimator on our website. We got all these leads. We follow up with them immediately. And of all the patients that came in for a consultation, mm -hmm. we found that the patients that knew pricing ahead of time compared to the patients that didn't know pricing ahead of time, that they were 41% more likely to book a procedure uh, at the time of the consultation right. than patients that didn't know price. So that should be music to a doctor's ears that like, so you mean I'll actually have a higher likelihood of moving these people from the exam room to the operating room. It won't just be a wasted consultation. It won't end in sticker shock. And that's what pricing allows. It's got to be accurate right. pricing. You can't bait and switch them. Right. And that's like the most critical thing to me. So that, that's kind of one data point that we found in that study. Well, I think that, you know, you, you touch on a couple of things. Why, uh, you know, this race to the bottom, why that doesn't always apply to surgery, because I think the one thing that, that even plastic surgery practices that are really good on the marketing side and everything else, I think, and only because I've been in the medical marketing uh, industry for so long, 25 plus years, what I, what I see with patients even today that hasn't changed, there is a fear factor, very subliminal fear factor when it comes to having any kind of surgery. There is a, you know, uh, we used to say the same thing with um, when we used to do a lot of LASIK advertising and LASIK outcomes are very predictable. Uh, satisfaction level for LASIK is through the roof uh, because it really is technology driven. It's not surgeon driven, it's technology driven. But yet the fear factor for, you know, patients when they're interviewed, when they're getting ready to have the surgery done, or they, you ask them, uh, you a little scared, oh, scared to death, you know, and, and that's when they're honest. That's when they're honest. And that's where, that's why they spend the little bit extra to go to places that they trust, because don't undersell that human element of, fear when it comes to surgery, you know, they're, and, and it's, I think it incurs patient loyalty to some extent because oh. they're like, they know that you just came out with the pricing. And I can't tell you how many times we've had patients ask us pricing when they call to schedule a consult or, and they may not schedule a consult. It's too expensive, but they, um, but they are kind of say over the phone, like, Oh, wow. You're actually going to give me the pricing. Like they asked for the pricing kind of completely expecting us not to give them the pricing and say, Oh, you got to come in for a consult and they're shocked. And, and that's okay. If we're too expensive and they don't book a consult. Well, I don't know why I would have wanted to schedule a consultation with that person because Absolutely. you know, it's, that is the, I mean, I'm not saying that price is the only pain point, but it is the ultimate pain point. They can get time off of work if they need to, they can schedule it another time. They can have somebody come and help out, babysit the kids, whatever. They can figure those things out. But if they can't get the financing, if they don't have the funds, they're not getting the procedure and they'll have to go someplace else that maybe is less expensive. Now, if you're like worried they're gonna go someplace else because it's less expensive than you lower your price, well, that's not price transparency. That's just you making that decision. That's that's not right. our fault for providing pricing. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's really definitely encouraged uh, loyalty with our patients. They're so thankful when they come in for the consultation, like, thanks so much for providing pricing. It's just, it's just easier. It's nicer. And I always hear other marketing people talk about, oh, well, you know, don't jump right into price, you know, explain to them the value proposition first. And like, I, I get all that. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with you explaining that the doctor's board certified, 
but but the patient knows you're beating around the bush and it's annoying. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about if you ask the price of anything and somebody starts telling you all this, what seems kind of extraneous at the time, like the value yeah. proposition and all. And you're like, I understand the, I understand this is a legitimate doctor. I've seen right. them operate on Snapchat. I've seen them operate on Instagram. Uh, you don't have to convince me that they're like a real person and that they, <laughs> they have good value. I just need to know the price. I need to know the price. I need yeah. to know the price, whether I'm going to schedule this concert, whether I'm going to take time off of work to come in to do a consultation or to do a virtual consult now. And so I just, uh, the, I understand that this is kind of an older school thought process of people talking about, you know, not throwing out the price, but this is an Amazon world. I mean, you're, you're going in the wrong direction now. Yeah. And I know I, that I have a, and I know I have a vested interest in this because I believe in this, but I'm, I'm, I want everybody listening to know that if you don't believe in price transparency, you're not willing to offer pricing, you're going, you're going the wrong way. That's it's that, that horse is out of the barn. Mm -hmm. All you can do now is mitigate what you think is the problem with it or manage it and do it in a way that's on your terms so that you're generating a lead out of it. When people come to your website, rather than people calling and you giving pricing over the phone and then they hang it oh. up. So you got to have to do pricing. Eventually it's, we're going to talk about this later about the federal government intrusion on that. Yeah, on that actually we, we will definitely get into that because I but you might as well get something out of it. all I'm saying. Yeah. Um, you know what? I, I just, to end that part of the conversation, mm -hmm. I am seeing more and more websites because I get, I do assessments. I, you know, my, my job is, you know, on marketing digitally, making recommendations to clients. I am seeing when I look at competitors of clients or even, you know, prospective clients, uh, I'm seeing more and more of what you're just saying. The, you know, the horses out of the barn, man, they're, mm -hmm. it's out there. And, and they're promoting yeah. us a lot more frequently than they did even two or three years ago. I agree. One of the things they're doing though, that I've seen is that they're saying uh, like they, they don't necessarily, if they don't have our price estimator on their website, which is a little more streamlined and a little more automated, um, they'll have like a thing. If you want to know price, enter your information in here. And it's like a website submission form. Mm -hmm. And the reason I always think that that's so lame is that when they do that, the person enters that information in, that means the office staff has to manually respond to those pricing requests. Mm -hmm. And if you really are encouraging people to check pricing, you're going to get a lot of manual, uh, uh, or excuse me, a lot, a lot of, of submissions, people requesting pricing. And sure, that's great lead generation, but you're also going to have to manually respond to all those people. And especially mm -hmm. if you're not really responding them with like true pricing information, you're like giving them a range of 5,000 to 15,000. Yeah, that's, that's the problem with those manual processes is that it, it, it breeds a laziness and you like yeah. try to just, you just send out an automated response that's not really accurate. That's the thing that's nice about ours is we don't give them an average uh, or a range. It's like, uh -huh. this is the price. And you're, and so people will say, well, what if they, you know, maybe if they're not a candidate for a mini tummy tuck, maybe they need a full tummy tuck. Right. Well, we do. That's what I always encourage people is like, well, stratify your procedures, have a mini tummy tuck price on there, right. have a full tummy tuck price, have an extended right. tummy tuck price on there. Right. And so when a person submits a wish list saying that they're interested in a mini tummy tuck and you're through our platform and we get their contact information, our office staff follows up and says, oh, we saw you're interested in a mini tummy tuck. Like, how much do you weigh? I mean, maybe mm -hmm. they don't jump right into it, but they ask right. politely. And when you find out that they're 200 pounds, you're like, oh, this is a teaching opportunity for me to say, mm -hmm. that's not going to be the right price. Let me send you the correct price that would be more appropriate for that. And so right. you still have the opportunity to educate them before they right. get into the consultation. So that, that's another pushback is like, what if they choose the wrong procedure? Well, you get their consult, you get their contact information. So even if they choose the wrong procedure, right. you still have an opportunity to educate them ahead of time. No. And I think you see that even, you know, even with like breast dog, they, they're asking for breast dog, but really mm -hmm. after, you know, two kids and, you know, the age that they need a lift. There's no way that just implants alone, they're going to be happy with what they're going to, you know, with the outcome, but you know, they, that's a learning opportunity. Um, Absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I mean, think, we list so many different breast procedures, like breast dog with silicone, breast dog with saline, breast dog and lift with silicone, yes. breast dog and lift with saline, breast dog with ideal implant, breast dog with shaped implant. I mean, I understand it's a lot of choices. They may not choose the right one, but again, after you get their contact information, then you can you do can, a more education yeah, over the phone. I think you can clarify that for them. I think that. Yeah, uh, I think one that's... quick thing before, in case you don't ask me about it. Yeah. A lot of people are uh, like, you know, we'll get down on, well, we generated a lot of leads, but you know, not a lot of the patients came in for a consultation. Okay. It is a numbers game. You need to understand that it's a sales funnel and you're trying mm -hmm. to get as many people up at the top 
eventually they will come down at the bottom. These are people that are interested in cosmetic procedures, at least in my practice. So they're getting these procedures done, may not be beat by me, but they're getting mm -hmm. them done somewhere. It's not like they're looking for a car and they stumbled on my website and that they're not no. interested in cosmetic surgery. So you have to understand that because pricing is so tantalizing, you will get a ton, a crazy number of leads. Mm -hmm. And so maybe percentage wise, not as many people will come in, but that percentage is probably a very large absolute number because there are so many leads you started with. The other thing is, they may not be ready to come in right now, but mm -hmm. if you're generating a ton of leads right now, you're mm -hmm. building a huge email marketing database. Absolutely. So now, if maybe you don't have the money to like do a Google AdWord or a Facebook ad this month, well, let's say you've built a, a email database like mine of 13,000 or 5,000 email addresses. Now you own your marketing. You can send out an e-blast whenever you want mm -hmm. and, and you'll, get, you'll get patients that way. So that's the other thing about having a huge email database is like, again, you can own your marketing and you can, you can decide what you want to do with it. You don't necessarily always have to pay the Facebooks or the Googles of the world. No, and that's a great point, Dr. Kaplan, mainly because as a marketer, I've always said, you know, marketing can do one thing for you. It's not going to make you sales. Marketing doesn't do that. At the end of the day, it boils down to where the rubber meets the road. When people walk into the office, talk to you over the phone, that's where the rubber meets the road. Marketing will help you separate the wheat from the chaff and somebody that you, you kind of pointed out, I don't care how much money they have. I don't care if they have, you know, the, the worst, you know, they need rhino class, whatever they need. They can need whatever you think they need, but if they don't have a desire or an interest in what you do, they're not a prospect. I don't care how much money they make. I don't care their age demographic. I don't care if they, if we all know that that person needs some work done, but if they don't see it, they're not a prospect. And I think that's what marketing does. It separates those people because they're not a prospect unless they have the one true qualifier. And it's not money, it's desire and interest. They will find a way to pay for a lot of things, especially the things that they want. Those are same, the same people that are walking out of the Best Buy with the new big, big screen TV, right. you know, I mean, think about that. Um, but I think you're right. I think marketing can help separate those people and, and the people that visit your site and through social media and stuff, they have an interest. And I think that's hugely valuable knowledge to know that, man, there's value in my marketing. Even if it didn't turn into a, a patient, man, I, I know who I've got 3000 people now who have an interest in, in what I do. And, and with uh, I think uh, touch points over the course of a year with a monthly email newsletter, they eventually may have the money. Their tax refund check may come in. Absolutely. They're, they're going to go to that person whose email is sitting in their inbox. Right. Okay. And, and just staying top of mind, just and make sure that you're helpful and don't just everything be promotional. Helpful information is always, you know, I've always believed in, in thought leadership content uh, always, even from the practice only a percentage of your stuff should be promotional. A lot of it is about helping, helping your patients, helping consumers make better decisions uh, and, and take care of themselves. Be, be better at, at helping them help themselves sometimes uh, is some of the most credible content that you can uh, put out there uh, simply because it, it now puts you in a different light. Right. And, and people talk about always like, educating the patient, you know, providing enough educational content on your website, like you were just talking about. Well, I hate to tell you, but part of that educational process is how much it costs. It's, cost, exactly. it's funny how they always withhold that. <laughs> <laughs> we want to educate you, just not on that. I'm just not going to tell you about that. Right. <laughs> I'm going to jump a little bit forward. And you had mentioned, and we had this conversation earlier, mm -hmm. um, because I had a, a client that mentioned, oh, I got something because they own their own ASC. They own their own ASC and then they got some litigate, you know, something on litigation about uh, hospitals and surgery centers required to put, you know, price transparency, putting pricing on their website and stuff. So they were asking me and I was like, I don't know anything about this, at, you know, at that time. And so we had the conversation, give us a little, for those that may not be as familiar with this, that, that don't own their own ASC or work in the hospital, that type of stuff. What, what is this legislation and what's the requirements? Give us a little detail. 
So the uh, the rules really apply to hospitals first, not not yet ASCs, but they're probably feeling like they're eventually going to be in the crosshairs. But what happened is during the Trump administration, he directed uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS for short. If you go to cms.gov, you can find like a whole thing on price transparency. But he directed them to require hospitals to show pricing on their websites, hospitals specifically, and mostly hospitals that accept Medicare, which are most of them. Um, and so what they did is they had two requirements. They said, first, you have to have a downloadable spreadsheet that's machine readable or and can be accessible by, to the consumer of a spreadsheet of all of your, <coughs> excuse me, of, of all your services. They also want to include supplies, but also services and also how they change based on the insurance that's paying mm -hmm. for it. So like right. if you're doing a gallbladder at the hospital, they want you to show in the spreadsheet how much the gallbladder costs from Aetna, how much the gallbladder costs from United Healthcare, how much it costs mm -hmm. from Cigna. So that was one thing, a downloadable spreadsheet. So you can imagine it's a huge spreadsheet in the hospital say, oh, there's no way we can do it. Well, they have to do it because CMS is um, this, this decision by Trump to uh, ask CMS to do it. Well, the thing is, it's interesting about it is it it's even though the presidents have changed administration, mm -hmm. it's it's a it's something in CMS's purview to be able to do. So it's still something that's in effect, even with the new administration. So people are hoping that it was going to go bye bye with uh, Biden. It's not true. The other thing it's going to be, it would be a very difficult uh, PR thing for Biden to say, oh, price transparency is not important. Yeah, I want to do that. Exactly. So you really can't reverse that. So this is something that's happening no matter what, even though Trump's no longer president. Mm -hmm. So CMS has said that's one thing hospitals have to have a downloadable spreadsheet. The second thing is they have to have a price estimator tool, uh, something that makes it easy for the consumer to see the 300 uh, most common procedures at the hospital. And of those 300, there has to be these 70 procedures. So CMS said you've got to do these, at least these 70 procedures that include yeah. like obstetric procedures, uh, colonoscopies, lab tests. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, psych, um, uh, mental health things. So it's 70 CPT codes that you have to do, but you can't just do those 70. You can choose the other 230. So you have to have a total of 300. So that's what CMS has done. And that took effect on January 1st. And people may be listening to this like, oh, I haven't heard about that. Well, hospitals have heard about it. I promise mm -hmm. you there. They fought it. The American Hospital Association was suing against it, saying that, oh, we can't, we don't want to release our negotiated rates because that's protected under the Trade Secrets Act. I mean, they were saying that these negotiated rates yeah. are trade secrets. They've been using that excuse for years, and the federal government, the, well, the judiciary said, no, that's, it's not a trade secret. Right. Um, so, so that's what's happened since January 1st, and I wrote a, a whole article on this in, um, in uh, medical economics about, you know, let me count the ways that hospitals are not complying with this rule yet. <laughs> and it's like I listed 10, 10 ways, and some don't have the spreadsheet. Some of them have the spreadsheets of just supply cost and not the procedure cost. Right. Some of them don't have a price estimator tool and the penalty for them not complying. And I'm, I don't know that CMS is actually levying any uh, penalties yet, but it's $300 per day. And you may think, Oh, a hospital, that's no big deal. $300 per day. Well, over the course of a year, that adds up to $109,500. So right. if, and if you're, if you're, if it's a for-profit hospital with shareholders, they probably don't want to be paying that. No, and, and what happens is if it's not on their radar, they don't even think about it. And it's amazing how quickly time passes. Exactly, <laughs> and then exactly. all of a sudden they get this, holy crap. <laughs> exactly, we got a bill. And the thing that's interesting about it is that, you know, this isn't just going to stop with the hospitals. There's another law that's coming through, and I guess it's possible they could slow it down or there could be litigation and things. But there's another law that's supposed to go into effect from CMS that was directed by Trump also that requires insurance companies to list all of their negotiated rates for with different entities, you know, like what rate they have with Google, what rate they have here mm -hmm. or there for different procedures. So that's the next ruling that's coming through that insurance companies have to list that. And the point of all this is that you may be in your own private practice, you know, maybe doing general surgery or internal medicine or plastic surgery thinking, oh yeah, I just do cosmetics. Or I'm in private practice. None of this applies to me. I will, I will say that while I don't know whether the federal government will ever institute these rules for independent practicing doctors mm -hmm. or for plastic surgeons, I don't know if they're going to do that. However, if the consumer is being told that they can sh uh, check these shoppable services, that's what they're called. If you can mm -hmm. check shoppable services on hospitals websites, well, how am I not able to check the most shoppable of services 
in the terms of cosmetic procedures. How am I not able to check pricing for that? So the consumer is going to be like, wait a second, I can check pricing on, at the hospital, but I can't check pricing in your practice. So now, even if the government doesn't force this on doctors, individual doctors, it's going to be consumer driven at the very least. Yeah. So people are going to have to have price estimator tools because that's going to be the most convenient way to do it, to be able to provide pricing to consumers. It, it's coming. There's no way it's not coming up uh, in the future. It's, it's mm -hmm. headed down the road for sure. You know, and, and I agree with you. It is as soon as the consumers acclimate to anything, whether it's technology or mm -hmm. an industry or setting expectations, wherever it may be. Uh, I remember years ago, um, we did a study on websites and you know, those little three little hamburger menu things right. uh, that they have that, that has the drop down of the Mobile, menus. Yeah. We did a study on that, what, maybe four years ago, maybe four years ago, maybe, maybe five and how many people actually knew what that was uh, and how much engagement did those hamburger menus get? And did it really uh, diminish user experience without having the whole row of navigation, traditional navigation? And it hurt at, you know, years ago, man, it hurt the, the usability, but today right. it's different and consumers, consumers dictate, consumers dictate what is acceptable, what it is, uh, you know, demand. And at that's the end of the day, example. that's what it is. Something as basic as that. That's such a great example of like, cause I would have used an example, maybe a little bit more complex. Like, you know, a year ago, most Americans probably didn't know how to use zoom. Well, yeah. they all know how to now, but I mean, a hamburger menu, that's like very basic. Like it's really basic. Seems strange five, four years ago, but now everybody knows. Okay. I, everybody knows that. what it is. So yeah. it, it's very similar to what you're talking about. It's consumers will ultimately create create the marketplace for sure um and, and same thing as i remember even with social media there was a lot of practices that didn't do anything in social media didn't believe in social media mm -hmm. when it came to plastic surgery and they were it was all about websites and seo and pay-per-click they really didn't invest a lot into their own social media and and have you know designated resources to 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 really market in social media but that's that's, that's changed today. I mean, and that's really too bad because social media, you can't really delegate it very well. And it's hard to do like, and website, it's hard to do. To, you can get somebody to build you a beautiful website and it'll work great. But social media, if you really want to have the engagement, man, it's exhausting. You it's exhausting. Gotta, but that, but I'm, again, and I'm into it, but it's exhausting. I know. I actually, I know you're into it. You actually have a really good following on social media. Uh, you're, you're highly engaged. All of your content is really personalized. It's, it's custom. It's not generic, really good stuff. Um, but, but I would agree. It's a lot of work, but the consumers demand it now. The, if you want those patients, you have to do some of this stuff. And that is kind of the positive feedback loop is that, yes, it's exhausting. It's a lot of effort, but when patients come in and they've been following you on social media for years and they finally got the money together or they mm -hmm. just finally decided it was time, and that they kind of know about you. And I mean, it, it's very much, very satisfying to know that you put the effort into social media when you have patients like that. Because the other thing is it's, it's not just about generating leads from social media. It's also the fact that because they've been watching you and because we broadcast our mm -hmm. surgery on, on Snapchat and Instagram stories with the patient's permission, of course, um, the, uh, the thing is that the, the, the patient comes in for a consultation and it's no longer just a 45 minute consultation right. where they're just now getting to know you. They've known you for months. And so mm -hmm. it's really a much better, more thorough, more educational uh, consultation because they've known you for so long. Yeah. It really is no. worthwhile. All good points. And I think it all feeds back into, you know, transparency is a great word, whether it's it pricing it's transparency, whether it's about. knowing what to expect when you come in for a consultation or when you, have surgery. Transparency is really, you know, at the end of the day, what consumers are demanding now. Um, True. And with uh, ingredients, with skincare products, with their foods. Yeah. Or, or with like, everything. With everything. When you go to McDonald's, now they have the calorie counts. Up <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like not great transparency because now I feel guilty about eating those. Now I'm feeling bad about myself. <laughs> Well, super. Hey, Dr. Kaplan, I want to thank you for taking, gee, almost an hour out of your time, 45 minutes out of your time to kind of share your perspective. I, I don't usually talk to people, uh, pro providers that really understand pricing. 
uh, because they're just scared of it. They're scared of having to deal with it. Uh, their staff is don't like dealing with price shoppers and stuff like that. But I think, you know, at least you're stimulating the conversation to, to call the elephant in the room and not only just deal with it, but how can we leverage it? I mean, at the end of the day, Absolutely. it's it's what can we do to be a differentiator? And that's what marketing is, is what can we do to differentiate our practice, our resources, our brand online that's different than everybody else. And in, in, in your case, a, a, a very competitive, you know, yeah. uh, you know, Bay Area marketplace. I mean, they say that per capita, there's more plastic surgeons here in San Francisco than- in Is there really? That's what they say. I don't know if it's true, but even if it's not true, I like the way it sounds. It sounds. Like I think it. I think it sounds really good, but, but <laughs> partly it's just because I'd like to live in San Francisco. It's a great place to live. Come and join us anytime. Um, you could be our <laughs> marketing, our, our, our marketing guru. <laughs> that sounds great. Well, yeah, Dr. Kaplan, I've been able to succeed in San Francisco without a huge database of leads. And we would have not been able to do that without the price transparency. Yeah. 13,000 leads. I mean, an email database of active of 13,000 active email addresses in yes. almost eight years. I couldn't have done it any other way. Yeah. I think, I think that that's a great point. It is, it is about um, developing not just immediate direct response, what converts there's huge value in, in marketing, just in general, everybody talks about branding, but part of branding is maintaining, you know, visibility to the people that are your highest quality prospects. It's kind of like uh, when I used to tell my wife, um, you know, I would talk about golf or, you know, golf things because I'm big into golf. She knows zero about golf, you know? So I, I was at a meeting one time. I said, you know, I mentioned Shrixon to my wife and she has no idea what that is. But to a golfer, we know what tricks on is because they developed the brand, you know, um, and you don't have to be a brand to everybody, but you got to be a brand to the target audience that is, has an interest in what you do. And I think that's what you're kind of, you know, getting bottom line is you got to brand to those people that 13,000. I mean, that's, that's who you need to brand to. Yeah. So hopefully eventually now the, we think of those 13,000 people either currently our patients or eventually will be our patients. Yeah. That's, yeah. The way we're looking that, at it. that's the way to look at it. Right. Well, Dr. Kaplan, thank you again for all of your time. Great insights. Uh, and, and I will get those resources that you mentioned uh, links great. and I'll make sure that I get those added, you know, down below in the, uh, in, in the webcast so people can actually check them out. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on. Always you a pleasure bet. talking to you. We'll be, we'll be chatting again soon, I'm sure. Excellent. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us for the MedShark Insider with Bill Fukui. Join us next week for another dive into all things medical marketing. All episodes can be streamed at www.medsharkdigital.com slash medshark-insider.